Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us this evening for a discussion on Billions Under Lockdown, the inside story of India's fight against COVID-19. I'm honored to have with me today to discuss the book and to discuss how the pandemic has since panned out in India, Professor Shubhato Bosch, Gardiner Professor of Oceanic History and Affairs at Harvard University. He is also a former Lok Sabha MP. Our other guest is Mr. C.K. Mishra, a former Environment Secretary and a former Health Secretary, and somebody who has very much been an insider in this pandemic fight in his capacity as a Secretary to the Government of India. Welcome to both of you, sir, and thank you so much for agreeing to this. So, uh, you know, the way I, I thought we'll, we'll do this is we'll have a discussion uh, for the first 30, 40 minutes, and then we'll, we'll you know, if there are questions, we'll take, take them. And uh, we can also take the questions as they come in, um, if that's okay with both of you. Yeah, yeah, we could do is that yeah. they come in. There's no problem. Okay, right. The last 18 months have been surreal and unprecedented. Never before has the world been so united in a single mission to defeat one virus. And never before has it been more disjointed when the chasm between the haves and the have-nots, and I say it both in a domestic and international sense, been more pronounced. India, as was always predicted, has emerged as one of the epicenters of the mayhem. In March 2021, when the graph, the world over, was on a downward flight, India was just beginning to erupt in a devastating second wave that left several hundred thousand dead. It's a sign of how bad things had become that we are now relieved at signs, apparently, of the second wave waning. This morning, we reported over 84,000 fresh cases and over 4,000 deaths. Billions Under Lockdown is my reporter's diary of the COVID-19 pandemic as it unfolded and the documentation of the way India responded. Some cases did not respond. It is also a story of how India was incredibly lucky at having turned back from where it did in September 2020 from a daily count of little over 97,000 cases. I wrote the book almost in real time and without the benefit of hindsight. And those of you that have read it would know that. I have been often asked why I chose to stop in January 2021. And I will answer that question in the course of this. As the pandemic progressed, the book became less about public health and more about hardcore difficult signs. And as we now know, some monumental missteps. I built in small anecdotes and a little bit of the background on the characters that I was writing about wherever possible, rather than to just keep it cut and dry. And of course, I borrowed heavily from my own published works and also that of my colleagues in the Indian Express and in the print. But there were many other people who have to remain nameless that made the book what it is by providing me information and access while working with a government which believes in strict control I would be ever thankful to them. Mishra, sir, uh, starting with you, uh, any first thoughts on the book? Oh, thank you, Avantika. Yes, the first thought on the book that I have is one of surprise. And the reason why I say, say so is that COVID being so complicated and an issue so emotional as COVID being captured real time is something that I thought was not possible. And it's not just about the illness, sickness, deaths that's been captured in this book. What is really, really remarkable about this is that even in that phase where everybody was mentally and physically so involved, the storytelling remained a bit detached a bit uninvolved, and yet the narrative was so good. I don't think ever in the history of this world we are going to have another COVID-like situation, or at least I hope not, because this is something that touched everyone, 
troubled everyone. And there are many aspects. If you read Avantika's book, there are many aspects. When folly is foolishness, brilliance, emotions, at times people coming up with ideas. Because one of the things that you see in India very often is that everybody has a view. Whether it is epidemiology, whether it is medical science, whether it is treatment, everybody around the corner has a view. So to take everything away from that and collate a story, a narrative that runs well and explains well, I thought is a tough one. If the book was written one year later, I wouldn't have said this. It's almost concurrent. So it's a creditable thing. And I think I would leave at that as my first thought. Professor Bose, sorry, I was on mute. Uh, uh, yes, uh, first of all, Abundika, I would like to congratulate you. Uh, for writing this book. Uh, someone uh, needed to chronicle this uh, unprecedented uh, public health crisis uh, and a humanitarian disaster uh, as it unfolded uh, in India. Uh, I remember I used to meet you uh, on your parliamentary beat during uh, the uh, 16th uh, Lok Sabha. Uh, and of course, uh, you didn't have very much of parliament to cover because uh, the, the people's representatives were rather sidelined uh, during the height of the crisis, even though you did show uh, how the parliament was, uh, you know, kept alive uh, until a state government could be overthrown uh, as the crisis was beginning to, uh, beginning to hit. But I thought that your dedication uh, to, you know, simply reporting what you saw and what you heard in real time uh, needs to be acknowledged and, uh, and applauded. Now, of course, uh, you end your chronicle in January 2021, so I'm sure all your readers have told you that you must write a sequel, because as we all know, the uh, a second wave uh, has been far worse uh, in India than the first. One of the lessons uh, that emerges from your book, uh, and even though you don't state it explicitly, uh, is that um, a famine or a, an epidemic or pandemic should never be treated simply as a problem of nature. It is always a problem of political economy, a problem of governance. Uh, this is what I learned years ago as a student uh, when I was studying agrarian economy, uh, famine. If you think about the Bengal famine of uh, 1943, it was not uh, caused by food availability decline. Uh, and, uh, and also, it's worth remembering that there were many more famine induced deaths in 1944 uh, than in 1943, uh, when the famine was at its, uh, at its height. You know, our colonial masters always tried to pass off problems of political economy, uh, disasters caused by wrong public policy as problems of nature. So even when the second wave struck, I think it is wrong to say that we were hit by a tufan, a storm. You know, it was not a natural disaster. And if it was a tufan in a metaphorical sense, then, you know, we could see the clouds gathering on the horizon and adequate precautions were not taken. So those are the lessons that we uh, need to learn uh, in dealing with crises, which turn out to be humanitarian disasters not try to shift responsibility to God or nature, but to see when faced with these kinds of challenges, what we can do. 
And I think your book is remarkably balanced because, you know, you show, um, you know, how there were, in fact, some very dedicated bureaucrats working very hard late into the night, um, you know, with a sense of compassion for the people whom they serve. And yet, in a systemic sense, there was something wrong. And I can say this with some authority because, you know, I was here in Trump's America from the 21st of March of 2020 to the 6th of November 2020. Uh, I saw on the airport monitor in JFK that, you know, he had lost uh, as I was taking my uh, flight uh, back to India. And I could see how the Trump administration's ineptitude, but also callousness, uh, contributed to the misery that people faced in the United States of America. And, and this is true, actually, of, you know, of all countries. And I can speak a bit later on what I see as the contrast between two regimes, two administrations in the United States of America. The global context is somewhat in the background, naturally, in your book. And it is entirely right that you should have focused on India. Uh, but really, many congratulations. And this will be an invaluable source later on when we look back uh, at the pandemic and try to draw lessons from it as we seek to bolster our public health system. Thank you. So when, uh, when I was writing the preface on January 16th this year, and I remember this because that was the day India's vaccination program started. Uh, and I genuinely believed that we had put the worst of the pandemic behind us. No, not because the SARS-CoV-2 virus had suddenly turned benign, um, but because we were rolling out a national program against vaccination. And I, I am really a firm believer in vaccines and science. And I, I thought this, I mean, yes, the worst is over. Uh, there were mutants on the prowl. And uh, given the way the virus had behaved in the past and in other countries, there was little doubt, at least in my mind, that a second wave would come. Uh, but I also firmly believe that with vaccines and the experience of the first wave, we would fare much better. I couldn't have been more wrong. Uh, Misha, sir, what did we do right last time? Or was it, you know, all just a matter of chance that things just fell in place? See, I think uh, let me first begin by saying that when the pandemic hit us first time, we were totally unprepared for anything like this. When it hit us the second time, we were actually technically prepared to handle a situation like this because we had gone through it once. Therefore, it's not possible that the first time was a fluke. It was, yes, it was a fluke in the sense that you learned as you went along because nobody knew what was happening. But there were certain positive issues of preparation of a good lockdown. It can be criticized on several grounds, and you have done it in terms of the migrants in your book, migration issues, etc. But the fact remains that a health system which is not resilient enough to handle even half of what was happening needed a repair needed an additionality to face up to things as they went along. You you were aware that in the, even in the first wave, the predictions were that we may go up to 2 lakh to 2.5 lakh cases. That we didn't go there, let me be very honest, it's God's grace. But the fact that if we reach somewhere around there, we had a measure of preparation which we thought was adequate. Now let me tell you two, three positives before I get into the negatives. India had never had a system of testing the way we did. And I still remember it was nightmare, those long nights that we used to spend in office trying to figure out how to increase the testing. And from 3,000, we came up to about 10 lakhs. 
that's that's a very positive story you use tb testing i i talk about that in the book yeah yeah <laughs> but you see it's not just testing look at the fallout of that manufacturing picked up and many things you became i mean of course the sad part of this entire manufacturing story is that every darji in every corner became a n95 ma ma mass producer so all those things happen in this country and we know that but the fact remains that we were able to put together our act which would have prevented a major disaster fortunately the hospitals in the first chance were never overwhelmed to be very honest to you if you ask me we escaped but never were really tested the way we are in the second week so the preparations were there the testing improved the hospital beds improved but as we went along instead of strengthening that some of the we kept losing it so that is a lesson to be learned that when you are globally seeing things happening pick up from what is happening all over because you are no special thing that it will not hit you that way hmm. but we got into a sense somehow and the communication went around that we were people genetically different and it's not going to impact us very much and to be very honest it is this inherent feeling or inherent uh, misplaced knowledge that took us by surprise when it came around the second time so there are many many learnings but to be very honest i think we reacted the right way and at the right time in the first time and we had issues in the second time which now of course thank god seem to have been resolved but the entire story one of the best lines of avantika that i like which describes a lot of these things is when he he mentions that in one particular chapter i'll not get into that but she says it was a monumental exercise in confusion building and in many sense many of the aspects of this entire thing we in india we talk about vaccination there are couple of issues which we don't do a to celebrate our success so when it comes to a crisis we do not know where we have succeeded then one place where india has succeeded that is immunity and been one of the examples for the world for a country like ours to falter when it comes to vaccinating the population is something that we need to very seriously think about where we went wrong thank you the obvious question after this though i planned it for later is what went wrong everybody wants to know in vaccinations why don't you keep it for the later <laughs> we will come in come to that we will come to that of course okay okay uh, professor boss anything you know uh, sort of as you as you went through the first wave and you read the book were there any pointers that you found that sort of you that you know this should have been the red flag this is where we should have known that we're going wrong and uh, we should have prepared better uh, did anything stand out like that to you um uh, first of all um, you know while i uh, agree with much of what mr mishra has said uh you know i i disagree on one crucial point uh and that is our response uh, to the the first wave uh, went you know badly wrong uh with the way that the lockdown was announced and implemented in late march of 2020 uh you know this was no way to announce a lockdown giving people less than 4 hours notice uh and it showed a complete imperviousness uh to the 
um, uh, to the misery that uh, some of the weakest sections of our you know population uh, would be exposed to. So you know that blunder is something that we must note and take lessons from. And in fact, even the shift in rhetoric during the second wave, I find is welcome, where some of the states, including my own, uh, have been avoiding even the word lockdown. Uh, you know, talking about restrictions. Now, in order to break a spike in, in infections when there is a surge, you have to somehow restrict mobility and mingling of people. But it's extremely important to take people into confidence. And again, uh, reading your book, uh, what struck me uh, was that um, while we have excellent scientists, uh, epidemiologists uh, in India and in the United States, in fact, I was fascinated to learn in the early part of our book that you had actually tracked down the director of uh, a retired one in, in Calcutta of a center for disease control that we have, which did do some, you know, testing and tracing in, uh, 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 you know, previous uh, uh, epidemics or would-be uh, epidemics. But I think what happened was that whether in the United States uh, or in India, the autonomy of um, the scientists, the scientific agencies linked to the government came to be badly curbed. Uh, from your book, we learn about the preposterous 15th August deadline that was given, right? Similarly, uh, Trump had announced that by election day, we may be able to say that we have a vaccine. Now, what has changed in the United States with the transition from a Trump administration to the Biden administration is that the autonomy of the knowledgeable people, the, the scientific agencies uh, has been restored. I mean, it was tragic to see how the world-renowned Center for Disease Control in Atlanta uh, had been just uh, made to appear as a mouthpiece of uh, a Washington-based uh, administration during Trump. But now the CDC in the United States has restored uh, its own uh, credibility. Now, as for vaccination, now we know that in India, because something went wrong, and, and I'd like to hear from both of you what you think went wrong with the you know, vaccination program, in India, but it's now clear that uh, India will not be able to vaccinate itself out of this crisis in the short term. You know, that's the uh, uh, upshot of what's happened in India. In the United States, things look somewhat better. Uh, Biden hopes, and he might well reach the target, that 70% of the US population will get at least a first dose. Uh, of, of the vaccine by the 4th of July. But there are two huge problems, as I see it, on, on the vaccination front as well, one domestic, one international. First, there are certain states in the south and the west of the United States which are lagging behind in vaccination. And therefore, they may well have outbreaks later in the summer, even in the United States of America. And the second uh, relates to a problem that you had flagged at the very outset, the problem of huge inequities. You know, the United States, we don't have enough. The United States has stockpiled vaccines and which they are only now beginning to say that they will share with the world. That's what Biden has announced in G7. Just imagine the FDA, the Federal Drug uh, Administration in the United States, has not even given its approval yet to the AstraZeneca vaccine. Yet the United States is sitting with a huge stockpile of the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine. So there are problems of iniquity between rich and poor countries, uh, rich and poor classes uh, within countries, as we see uh, now unfolding in, uh, in India. Uh, with those who have access to money and private hospitals being able to you know, get 
their vaccines, but the poor people uh, dependent on government uh, outlets are left uh, high and dry. So uh, that problem of inequity is still there, even on the vaccination front. Uh, even though the vaccine rollout, as we all know, uh, has been uh, fairly efficiently handled, both in the United States and the United Kingdom, both countries were floundering in the you know, first wave. Just think about uh, you know, March of 2022, say June of 2020, uh, a year, year ago. So that's where we stand, and uh, that's what I wanted to say, particularly on vaccines and inequality. Uh, drawing from the work that you've done. So actually, when you talk about, you know, independence of scientists, I'm reminded of this thing and I talk about it in the, in the book. So last May, a group of epidemiologists wrote to the government saying that you're not listening to us. Please talk to us. You have bureaucrats running the show. This is, sorry, sir, with your apologies to you. Uh, you have bureaucrats running the show. Uh, please talk to us. So at this point of time, so I'd done a story and a very senior bureaucrat, he actually told me, you know, whether you like it or not, bureaucrats have always run this country and they will continue to do so. And I was actually quite, um, I mean, I don't know if amused is the right word, intrigued is the right word, but when the going got really tough in the second wave, uh, this particular bureaucrat was the one who did a complete disappearing act from, in, from everything. So, uh, you know, so the one thing about this is how bureaucrats took on the role of scientists and how scientists and that we are seeing now actually scientists are increasingly talking like, uh, you know, administrators are like bureaucrats. So that, that has, it, that this, this entire, you know, this merging of roles, uh, roles are getting um, sort of, fading into one another really and that I think has been one of the problems uh, and probably that is also why you know so when I, like I was as mentioning that January 2021 I thought it was over and clearly I was not the only one because the government of India thought the same which is why we held a kumbh mela uh, we held uh, this you know very long elections in West Bengal my home state and yours um, there was a long eight phase elections, crowds, no masks, all of that. And, and it was really, you know, sort of, uh, it was almost an illusion to think that you could hold rallies, you could hold political rallies with COVID appropriate behavior. That doesn't happen. It, it was, it was just not possible. And that's exactly what happened. Um, and so, Mishra sir, you know, where, where do you think where do you think we lost the plot? Uh, you know, first let me take your point about scientists and bureaucrats. Because I am a firm believer that any such problem, leave alone this pandemic, any medical problem, the solution lies in science. And as long as, as a bureaucrat, a group is willing to convert that scientific knowledge into public health delivery system, you are likely to succeed. But in a lighter way, Avantika, there are bureaucrats and there are bureaucrats. Of course, sir. And mm -hmm. uh, what we see today is the other side taking over as bureaucrat. Yeah. So, I mean, not uh, meaning anything, but we are back to square one. So this is one problem that we faced constantly. Second is, I'm, I'm first talking about the overall issues. We as a country have never had public health center stage. So when a pandemic of this nature hit us, the delivery points somewhat got clocked. And we as a country, look at the history of India. Rural National Mission, Rural National Health Mission, 
रूरल एग्रीकल्चर मिशन रूरल एक्स मिशन रूरल वाई मिशन एंड वेन इट हिट दी अर्बन एरियाज वी वेट टोटली पेड थिंकिंग दैट द प्राइवेट सेक्टर विल टेक केयर विच अनफॉर्चुनेटली वॉज रॉन्ग that somehow other we got an impression that we had come to terms with covid this again is linked to the science that i was talking about if that had not happened then we would have done a much better job and then the preparations that we got into because of this impression fell into and it was not just the government or the bureaucracy or the scientific community are some of the epidemiologists who were going on saying things like whether it was through government communication or otherwise people got this impression that this was it so i mean allowing somebody to go to a rally a coma or whatever is one thing but not fearing life and going <laughs> gives you the impression that you also think that it's not going to happen so that is one issue the problems of oxygen the problems of bed you you actually mean schizophrenia sir why so professor amartya sen used that word okay talk about our covid thing he said you know this is this government was in a state of schizophrenia uh i would not use that word <laughs> but having said that you see we thought that if our health systems get overwhelmed we will be able to overcome it that was not to happen because we were completely caught and it's not just about beds and oxygen medicines everything we are the uh um, when pharma center of the world yeah but then when it came to emergency productions we faltered initially then of course cat up cast up now on vaccination which is being debated so badly you know one of the issues that we must remember is that we have a tendency of finding a new solution to every new problem we do not look into our backyard to see if a solution is already there india has been successfully vaccinating tracking vaccination to even i don't think we need to create new systems to add to chaos second the production did not keep up there could be several explanations it some people argue that indian companies were not promoted some people argue that there were not, not enough orders all that may be true but at the end of the day today even if the entire infrastructure of rural health system is used to vaccinate people where is the vaccine yeah you have a problem i mean i would put it that this kind of a planning should have happened much sooner see if we are trying to think that we will be bailed out by external efforts of companies outside india let us clearly understand that their orders are so heavily booked order books are so heavily full that even if they say so nothing is available in egypt so what is available to us is our own strength and i think the government as a nation as a community we should strengthen our inherent strengths rather than weaken them that is our only solution the problem is not vaccine procurement 
it will not be solved by vaccine availability. It has to reach the arm. And the planning should not stop at merely getting vaccines. It has to go on till actually the needle pierces the arm. And I think third wave, no wave, nobody knows. But one thing everybody knows is that if you are able to vaccinate a substantial population, even if there is a wave, it will be nothing like the second. And fortunately, having learned our lessons quickly, we will be in a position to, at that point of time, try and save people from dying. We have seen misery of the migrants in the first, misery of patients in the second. We have seen exemplary efforts of people trying to undo the wrongs in the first one, equally exemplary efforts by medical fraternity and others in the second one. The lesson for the country is to collate all this, the good, bad, and the ugly, and try and redo things in a way that the country is used to instead of reinventing ourselves every time. Thank you. We we have some questions coming in. Um, uh, Deepankar Mitro is asking, uh, could you comment on the issue of black fungus? Um, so what I I would like to ask is, you know, steroids, we actually learned about steroid use from abroad. We didn't know about it. I, we learned it, about it from Italy. So how is it that it's only in India that this is such a big problem? Uh, precisely, Avantika. My question is, and uh, Professor Guleria once was explaining that uh, the... One of the reasons is early administration of steroids. But that does not explain the question you just put forward. Why is this India? So according to me, there has to be something more than that that is happening which is causing this black fungus problem. Apart from the fact that we have run out of medicines because nobody thought about it. So in this entire story of COVID, one thing has been a constant. Every expert has been surprised at every corner. Something new has taken over and you didn't know what it was. And black fungus, according to me, is just another story of that name. Now, it is not easy, according to me, to immediately pronounce a judgment on the cause. Whatever, whoever is saying are plausible causes, I think it will take a while of scientific research to really find out why it happened in India and not anywhere else. One of the answers possibly could be, I wouldn't say uh, misuse, but overuse of steroids, or at times even misuse of steroids. I mean, one has heard of cases, very mild symptoms, but steroids coming in as if it's on auto mode. You know, the WhatsApp has been circulating prescriptions as a standard prescription with steroids and built into it. As if presuming that that is a requirement of the human body. This brings me to a larger issue. This is, I've got a platform to say this, so I'm saying it. Antimicrobial Resistance is something that not just India, but the entire world needs to watch out for. We are victims of AMR, and unless we really fight AMR, we will land into several troubles like the Black Fund. Thank you. Uh, question. So, uh, and I would like both of you actually to answer this, if you would. Uh, Tejamoy Ghosh is asking, how in your opinion has politics influenced our response to the pandemic and its overall management? I mean, 
has it been politics how has politics influenced our pandemic management uh, professor well Bush, i'll take that he, professor yeah. Lynch is far more qualified to answer <laughs> this question <laughs> uh, you know uh, as i was listening to mr mishra speak about planning uh, or the lack thereof uh, not adequate planning for the for the second wave i was being reminded uh, of a, a conversation between uh, Shubhash Chandra Bose and Meghnath Shaha in 1938, uh, as uh, Netaji was preparing to form the National Planning Committee. And both of them called for a partnership uh, between science and politics. And uh, it's an interview uh, and a conversation that came out uh, was held uh, under the auspices of the Indian Science News Association. So journalism uh, played a role and it was first published in a journal called Science and Culture. But unfortunately that partnership between science and politics that they had envisaged was something that was lost. Uh, and uh, particularly at the you know height of the uh, crisis. Uh, now, uh, you know, a, a scientific temper does not mean blind faith in science. Uh, and scientists also made mistakes uh, in the early part of the pandemic. After all, we were dealing with a completely new virus, a novel virus. And even on basic things like uh, a mask mandate, very well-known scientists got it wrong in the early stages of the uh, of the pandemic but overall i think it was extremely important uh, to let scientists and scientific agencies affiliated with governments and i'm talking not just about india but also other countries including the united states that ought to have been respected and therefore politics did play a role in you know, making the pandemic much more complex uh, than it would have been otherwise. And for India, I feel it's a tragedy because unlike Trump's America or Bolsonaro's Brazil, there was no outright denial of scientific truth or the reality uh, that was hitting us. And yet, power politics took precedence over tackling a humanitarian disaster. Now, Obuntika, I can understand the conclusion that you reached in mid-January of 2021. Uh, and I can understand that, you know, what people thought uh, was, was happening at that stage. Perhaps we had left COVID behind. But look, by late February, certainly early March, there was enough information available uh, about uh, a second wave. And yet, there was no course correction. And there, I think uh, Tejomoy Ghosh is right in, uh, you know, suggesting through his question that politics did influence our response, that uh, the quest for more power, more power, agreed for power, at even a state level, took precedence over, you know, tackling uh, a major crisis where one could see that human beings were suffering uh, in, uh, you know, our, our city hospitals were full. But, you know, we've, we've seen what happened in our major urban centers. What I really worry about now in India is that we really don't have a full picture of what has transpired and is unfolding even as we speak in our countryside, in, in the rural areas, where the public health infrastructure is far weaker than in our towns and, and cities. And I really hope that, uh, you know, we've talked about bureaucrats, but the political leadership will get their priorities right. And, uh, you know, I would say each political party has enough power whether at the center or at the level of states. Let them not try to aggrandize further, but just settle down 
and govern for a change. So you want to take that? This question? No, no, I think I accept for saying two things. One, I am not very competent in commenting whether the polit politics of it was positive or negative. But it would be extremely naive of any of us to think that in a democratic setup, and particularly a setup like India, politics would not play a role. It would certainly play a role, and at times it could play a very constructive role, at times it could be. But one thing that becomes very clear is that if political thought is unified, things get done much better. There will be politics. I mean, that's the nature of the way we work. Thank you. Uh, Mo Chatterjee is asking, how effectively are we using the data from the second wave infections to understand the nature of breakthrough infections and long-term efficacy of vaccines? See, I am, I am no expert or a technical person, but uh, we always had a robust system of data collection post-vaccination. And uh, whether you take the AFI data or whichever data post-immunization, India has had a very, very robust system. And uh, I can say with some amount of confidence that the way we go about it, it's a fairly good knowledge of what impact it is having and how effective it is. So if the data and research says it is effective, I think we have every reason to believe that it is. Uh, there's, yeah, Professor Bose, you were saying something. Well, um, no, I, I simply uh, wanted to say that there is now some uh, real life data from, from certain countries uh, about you know vaccination and breakthrough infections and uh, and so forth, but I think that uh, again uh, the public has typically been confused uh, with you know contradictory messages coming from governments about, for example, uh, the length of the interval between the first and second dose of vaccines. I think it's pretty clear now that even though there could be breakthrough infections, even two weeks after a, a, a second dose, that uh, two doses of any of the major vaccines will protect against uh, severe disease, uh, hospitalization, and, and certainly death. And that basic fact needs to be communicated, uh, particularly to those who are, you know, vaccine, uh, uh, vaccine hesitant. You know, there is data about that. But again, you know, there are certain common sense decisions that we ought to have be able to take. For example, there was a time when it was being suggested that the efficacy of a vaccine uh, would increase in the medium term if you stretch the, the gap between the two doses. And yet, everyone knew that protection was needed here and now when the second wave was at its peak. So even if it was scientifically true that an eight to 12 week interval uh, would increase efficacy in the long term, six months down the line, it clearly made sense to get the vaccine if you could, you know, four weeks after your first dose, if you wanted to protect yourself against the second wave at, at its peak. So these are, uh, and it's not right for, you know, governments to, you know, give messages which appear to be scientifically sound, but in fact may be either influenced by uh, a lack of availability of vaccines, uh, or it doesn't really make sense when you are facing a huge second wave. Um, so, uh, I, so I think, for example, it was good to take a second dose of the vaccine in India in April, if one could, uh, in order to, you know, protect against uh, infection. Yeah. Yeah. So 
unfortunately in april i think the only people who would have been eligible uh, would no that would have been some uh, 60 plus categories also but mostly healthcare and frontline workers but one That's interesting right. thing that i found here and when i was looking up you know during my stories um, is that elsewhere when they changed so for example when uk uh, changed the vaccine dosage schedule they actually gave out very clearly that these are the studies we are looking at and this is what will happen if we reduce the dose whereas for us you know there was no such public communication we were just told please trust us um whereas you know off the record we were told yeah there's a problem with supply so we are just making do with whatever we have and that's why we are looking for first dose efficacy um but you know I, and that's actually one of the questions that's come in you also mentioned the messaging um and and that's so this time when um at the peak of the crisis in delhi and i would as i would sit in the covid briefing i used to get this feeling that you know this is one insulated place you know all the death destruction morbidity outside this place makes it sound so positive and it's it's almost like the outside doesn't exist and this is the official government of india weekly covid briefing that would only talk still about positives when we were you know reporting humongous numbers of deaths and cases so uh, gautam vishash actually makes a point like that saying that you know right now everybody thinks that the second wave is over but is it really over since i found that the death count today is almost similar to that of the peak of last season well a very valid question to everybody who's listening it's not over we've been talking to each other for the last 5 days saying that we've come below 1 lakh per day please remember that you was at a stage which was the peak of the first wave 89 to 90000 was what we reached in the first wave so you're still there you have not come down so covid appropriate behavior vaccination all these hold for very well i mean you need to do it second issue is that you know on the communication bit one of the things that people have been complaining is that there is no campaign kind of a thing happening with people who know very little with whatever is happening with the whatsapp university in india misinformation is not countered by information and even if it is information many a times it is it's not intelligible to everyone so unless you communicate in a language which people can understand in a transparent manner there are people who will take advantage and keep raising doubts here and there it's our responsibility to put an end to that and put out facts which people should be able to understand i think we need a strong campaign on that thank you uh, uh. Yes. talking about communication professor bose isn't it like a trend the world at least at one point of time wasn't it a trend the world over that political leaders were trying to sort of talk down the pandemic and say that you know this doesn't exist everybody did that at different points of time boris johnson did trump did bolsonaro did everybody did that so isn't it like i mean it almost sounds like a valid political strategy to counter the pandemic not valid but a very favorite one of our political leaders across the world well i think you've uh, really named the ones uh, who who really engaged uh, you know in this kind of dismissal that it's just the small flu said trump it would you know it would go away and uh, uh, boris johnson i think uh, shifted his rhetoric somewhat after he himself uh, suffered a, a severe case of uh, Uh, of covid uh, bolsonaro never reformed and that's why i find it so tragic that uh, in india that even though there wasn't this kind of uh, blatant denial uh, of uh, the reality unfolding uh, for people uh, you know 
uh, around the, the politicians, we still ended up with an element of real hubris, uh, particularly in early 2021, and made the second wave much worse for us uh, than it uh, need have uh, been. Uh, and, and of course, uh, you know, since we had reached well over four lakhs uh, of infections a day, reported ones, uh, and now it's down below one lakh, uh, we have this, uh, you know, at least this, uh, the optics of the trend going down. And obviously, you know, uh, the uh, number of deaths always has a lag of at least two weeks. So the death counts are still still high, but we really need to be need to be very careful and sure the political leadership needs to be much more responsible uh, in its uh, communication uh, to the people uh, whom they represent uh, you know of course the vaccination drive needs to needs to pick up but you know covid appropriate behavior will have to continue in india for for, for much longer uh, you know, in the United States now, you don't have to wear masks if you are out in the open, but that's not going to be right in India for quite some time to come. And therefore, the messaging uh, from those who are responsible, you know, really must be on the mark. So I have a question to ask of both of you. Um, and, you know, we've We've said so much about Trump, but it seems Trump was right in, I mean, he was making, in hindsight, he's now making a lot of sense when he was talking about the origins of the virus. Uh, you know, all this thing about China being complicit in, in whichever way. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I, I would like both of you to talk about that. Mishra, sir, are you there? Okay. Okay, you want me to go first? I thought Professor Bose sitting there could give us uh, an idea. Well, uh, you know, it's really uh, uh, the, the fact of the matter is that, uh, of course, uh, China bears a good part of the uh, responsibility in terms of the way it uh, communicated with the world uh, on the outbreak uh, of, the, of the virus in Wuhan. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, I, uh, we need to be careful about, uh, you know, what we claim at this stage, uh, because there is no uh, clinching evidence of, for example, the lab escape theory and so on, which is do doing the rounds on certain uh, television uh, channels. And uh, one of the things that I think uh, we need to recognize that this is a global pandemic, wherever it might have originated. And we do need a global coordinated uh, response to it. Uh, you know, I agree that there are certain things that we ought to do in India, which we are good at uh, and so forth. Um, you know, ramping up our manufacturing facility of vaccines, you know, using vaccine delivery systems that have uh, worked, particularly in the case of children's vaccines, if not uh, adult vaccination. But I think that Atma Nirbharata has its limits in the context of, you know, the global connections that are very real. So we should keep that in mind. And, you know, Trump is, is playing a a very, you know, uh, strange blame game born out of his own political frustration. So we need not be, you know, wholly swayed uh, by the statements coming out of mar a lago in Florida. Havantika, I have a slightly different take on this. Uh, Trump, China, leakage, all these are non-established facts. Why are they non-established facts? Because the one organization in this world which had the primary duty of establishing how it happened did not do it. Yeah. And I'm talking about the WHO. WHO, yes, of course. The biggest failure, if any, why blame Trump? If he was making a wrong statement, what was WHO doing? 
So if there is a collective failure, and I, I have no hesitation in saying that, that they have let us down badly this time. So it, it is for them to find out where it came from, what happened, what mutations, whatever. The world has so much of faith in that organization. You can't let the world down like that. Thank you. There is, so we're running out of time, but there is one last question, and I think this is for me, obviously, which is, uh, so Shumana Bishaj is asking uh, whether I am planning to write a sequel of the book. Um, maybe I will. I have to structure it. I still don't know, and I, 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 I have to sort of think about it. But yes, I would probably love to do a sequel. Uh, and given that the pandemic, where I ended the book, the pandemic hadn't even started in India. It's really the second wave that's that's uh, been most devastating. So yes, and there's a lot to write, especially right now. The origins of the virus is. That's a very fascinating discussion. I'd like to deal with that as well. Uh, so uh, uh, we, um, that I think the, we've. That's all time we have uh, today. Just, just one sentence, Avantika. Yes, sir. Please. See, and this is for the viewers and everyone. When Avantika used to be reporting, I always said she's the most balanced and brilliant reporter on health issues. And let me tell you, Avantika, this book has surprised, uh, surpassed my expectations. And I repeat, a real-time narrative of a tragedy of that nature is not easy. You've done exceptionally well. Congratulations. Thank you so well, much, sir. Thank you. Let, let, let me endorse what Mr. Mishra has just said and uh, add that you really must write uh, a sequel to this book. We don't really have very many specialist journalists writing about health issues, which are so important in our country. And therefore, uh, I think you really need to put your mind to it. And uh, you've recorded the first wave and it's waning. Uh, you do need to write about 2021 with as much insight as you have about 2020. Thank you. Thank you so much. And so here's the book. I was I was supposed to do this in the beginning, um, uh, so please. I have it in my hand too. Please. Sir, you have disappeared. Actually, huh? Your How? video is gone. Am I yes, back? Yes, you're back. Oh, you were for a brief while. I don't know what is happening. Poor network. Mm -hmm. There's a message. Poor network. Yeah, yeah. I think so. I think so. I think so. So, uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Professor Bose. Thank you so much, Mishra, sir. Thank you for making time. And thank you so much, everybody, for watching. So, I have it uh, not in physical form, but I have it on my uh, iPad. So, here it is. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. All thank the best. You, everybody. Thank you.